welcome to The Near Memo, a weekly conversation about search, social, and commerce. What happened, why it matters, and the implications for local. I, I, th- I mean, you guys, uh, I'm surprised af- having been observing Google for as long as, as I have, at least in Mike's case, uh, that your expectations aren't radically lower. Like this to me is total par for the course um, based on every signal Google has sent since late 2021. So, well, so, so quick, a quick, quick adjacent digression apropos of the stopped investing in Google business profile. I mean, I just want to flag the issue that we, that I wrote about this week in the newsletter, which is the seeming continued disappearance of the, of the local pack. There's, there's conflicting information about that empirical versus anecdotal, but Joy Hawkins brought up this week that she was seeing, um, she was seeing some reduced traffic or not reduced traffic. She was seeing fewer instances of the local pack itself in certain categories that she was monitoring. Legal is, is an example. And other people have mentioned this. Um, and then I include some data from Rank Ranger uh, and local SEO guide, which are kind of inconclusive. And But um, I mean, just real quickly on this, do you guys see uh, Google kind of walking away from the local pack um, or, or showing it less frequently. I mean, we speculated about the role that the European, uh, digital markets act might have, but maybe it's also, a, um, if it's true, maybe it's also kind of a monetization thing because we've seen evidence that when LSAs appear, people gravitate toward those and click on those. And maybe we don't have any data on this, but maybe the presence of local packs and LSAs reduces the number of clicks on LSAs. That would be a total conspiracy theory, but there, there's the tinfoil hat coming out. Right. Well, I had someone had to wear it in your absence. That's right. So. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I would say, I in my mind, the likelihood that a an organic result, it, like the, if you you know threw a hundred darts at a wall or whatever, right? The likelihood that an organic result is a good result is much higher than the likelihood that a three pack result is a good result in some of these EEAT categories, which significant legal categories that Joy Hawkins was looking at probably qualify. So. Uh, I think it's potentially an admission from Google that the results are just, the organic results are just better. In some categories, that's not the case. If you're in coffee shops or restaurants or, you know, touristy things, I think Google Maps and pack results are probably better by and large than an individual website that Google might show or get in a localized organic result. So uh, to me, maybe, I think it feels a little bit like Google's, you know, maybe just admitting that, um, the, that the quality of the results are are not as high as they should be in certain categories. Well, we'll have to. I, we'll I would just expand on. I mean, I think David's direction of argument is interesting and totally plausible. Yeah. There is another argument that the tools we're using looked are you measure the results based on previous queries that were developed, and it could be that Google is recalibrating local one because more longer tail queries due to services or products are showing the pack a lot. Or it could be that they're planning for the advent of SGE or whatever the hell it's called at the top of the local local search and trying to make room for it. So there's a number of plausible sort of theories. Who knows, right? And our tools that we use to measure these are retrospective because they're based on queries that used to show packs. We, if there's a whole range of new queries that show back that we that aren't in those tools, then we would be missing out on the information. So I don't really know. Well, it'd be very interesting to, to track the as David is suggesting to sort of look at the EEAT categories and see if if that thesis holds holds up over time. And to reinforce that, lawyers have been targeted by Google in this sort of filtering of reviews, and it's a category rife with fake reviews. So. I mean, it would, that would reinforce David's point. I mean, that and category. historically, obviously, all of the crazy business title spamming that the, you know, best Orange County personal injury lawyer near me, you know, dash yeah. Irvine has and, been just rampant in the local pack since time immemorial. So and local uh, location spamming with, you know, virtual offices and stuff. I mean, it's really yeah. rampant in the legal space. So it could be yeah. that would reinforce David's point that the local results in that in that sense are not very good. <clears throat> so is ChatGPT going to become a viable alternative to Google for local queries is a question that's 
you know, kind of on the minds of many people and certainly something that I've talked a, a great deal about. And I just got access this week to plugins and uh, web browsing for GPT-4. Um, and just my quick, very, very quick since yesterday <coughs> analysis of this is that they they both kind of suck. And, you know, David, before we started this uh, recording, you said, well, this is MVP, this is an MVP. And, you know, the implication is it'll get better and better over time, which is, of course, probably true. But what I experienced is that they're very slow. Um, they can't be used together right now. So you can't do web browsing and plugins at the same time. And the web browsing piece, especially in a local context, and I have to do a lot more research on this, seems to rely heavily on certain kinds of directories. You know, they've identified certain directories that they think are going to be sources of data, I guess, in different categories. And they're feeding results from those directories. And the process by which they're doing, I don't, I don't know enough technically about what's going on to really explain it, but they're, they're, in the background, they're clicking on results. I don't know whether they're crawling Google or whether they've got their own, you know, what, what the mechanism is, but the, 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 the messages on screen seem to suggest that they're going back and forth into different sites and then retrieving results from those sites, imitating what a user might do. <clears throat> so... Uh, it's very substandard right now and not a threat to Google in any way whatsoever. Um, and again, it probably will get better, but, but this is, this is a, to me, it's a disappointment because I mm -hmm. like the simplicity of the UI and uh, was hopeful that this would be kind of a viable alternative. Now we'll wait and see what happens with Bard uh, as Bard brings maps and the knowledge graph and, you know, sort of better web search. As Google brings those things to Bard, you know how how it compares. But right now, Bard is not a great local search tool either. So maybe Google's <laughs> position is safe, which would be um, sort of disappointing if that was true. But um, I mean, we talked about this last week, though, that Google is making clear distinction between SGE as a search supplement yeah. and Bard as a sort of hallucinogenic hallucinatory <laughs> AI tool that they really want to be cautious about and they're going to roll it into their application environment rather than into general search. Right. They, they, they're they trying to preserve the distinction between search and this generative AI tool that can help you do other things that you typically wouldn't do in search. Right. Exactly. And I think that that, I think they're sincere about that. And I think that what they said about it is what's the case. And that document, I should review the PDF, the 19 pages about what is SGE, you know, it's, it's supplements, search results on questions where there isn't a right answer. You know, it's not. Uh, How it's many not questions a, have a right answer anyway, other well, than who yeah, won the we, game? We, certainly that's a huge existential argument. And <laughs> we need my son. The well, who won, who won the Steven game? <laughs> Oh, but what, what does winning mean? Greg, what's your definition of win? Score is higher than other score. <laughs> right. The, nu so. the Nuggets beat the Lakers the other night. That's right. Uh, I would say, uh, Greg, to your point about, you know, it being a disappointing experience, I, you know, the MVP philosophy is sort of embedded in Silicon Valley. But I would say that one of the reasons that ChatGPT uh, has done so well at capturing potential market share, certainly mind share of society, is that it was so much more than an MVP. It was, a, as Rand yeah. Fishkin likes to call it, an exceptional viable product uh, right. right out of the gate. And, you know, we've, I think we've talked about this in earlier near memos, uh, the, the failure of Apple Maps to deliver on that has, has even, is even still hindering the adoption right. of Apple Maps because people have- Certainly the reputation of Apple Maps. A, a terrible experience with it in the first go round. And so I think people, you know, maybe ChatGPT has earned some, you know, retrial uh, frequency based on the amazingness of that first experience. But I think they do risk, um, you know, permanently turning people off with substandard plug-in integrations and that sort of thing. So, uh, and generally speaking, as you know, I'm very bullish on Google's long-term uh, standing in the space. And I don't necessarily, I mean, I think we may see death by a thousand nicks from various uh, instances of generative AI as a 
search enhancer or what have you, but I don't see chat GPT bleeding meaningful market share from Google. Um, sir, I certainly even less so based on the experience that you're reporting this week. Right. So. Well, I think, I think that's right. I, I, you know, in my own experience, as I've said a bunch of times before, I'm using Google less today than I have just without really consciously intending to do so. Like I'm going to use Google less. It's just, it's happened that way. I use Bard and Perplexity and Neva and Bing and ChatGPT for things that I might have all only gone to Google for. But I agree that Google's position seems to be pretty secure, uh, given what we're seeing right now. Um, I mean, you know, what, what's kind of interesting to me, and this is another digression that we don't have a lot of time for before we get to your item, David. Uh, there was an interesting power review survey that talked about how, and I wrote about this also, how uh, people are more wary of fake reviews now across the internet. They they focused on the retail vertical. They didn't look at local per se, but what they found was Amazon was the site that caused people the most concern and 84% of the respondents, and this was 13,000 US adults, 84% of respondents saw Amazon as the site with the most uh most problematic in terms of fake reviews. So by far, Amazon was the place that they knew that they were going to encounter fake reviews. And to me, this is very interesting because it illustrates a kind of gap between trust and compulsion to use, right? So we're in a situation where people's behavior may not look that deviant from past norms. Facebook is another example of this. Uh, lots of people still using the product but people don't trust it. They're not as invested in it as they once were. And so I think that's a very interesting thing. And we may see something like that happen over at Google a little bit, um, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what, what occurs. Thanks for joining David, Mike, and Greg. To stay on top of the latest developments in local, subscribe to our newsletter at nearmedia.co. We'll see you next week.